Hello, everyone. And we can't see your faces. So um, it's going to be a fun, a fun chat where we are going to be having this tell all conversation um, with some of my colleagues. Uh, we apologize, but one of our panelists was unable to be with us today. Um, but we still promise you a tell all and a really great conversation ahead. Um, just to get us started, I just some opening remarks. We want to thank Catalyst 2030 so much for hosting uh, this event and this week. It, Catalyst 20, uh, 2030 is the world's largest event uh, led by social innovators, by entrepreneurs, and they're here to share knowledge, exchange ideas, and accelerate uh, collaborative systems change. And so the week is coordinated by 20, uh, Catalyst 2030. It's a global movement. And um, all sectors are coming together to share the common goal of creating innovative, people-centric approaches to attain the sustainable development goals. So as Indigenous actors in the impact investing space, we have an important role to play in this global movement. And the voices and the insights of Indigenous peoples worldwide should be embraced by everyone as a collective effort, effort to catalyze positive social change. This is particularly important when we consider the intergenerational wisdom and ancestral knowledges and unique worldviews that are held by those with historic ties to the earth and to the land. And with whom we must strive to create these renewed relationships if we're able to tackle the cross-cutting challenges that transcend all of our social, environmental, and economic um, challenges. And so to get us started, I'm going to um, acknowledge that I am calling in from Tokoronto, uh, also known as Toronto, Ontario, Canada, on Turtle Island. I am Anishinaabe with um, ancestral ties to Northern Ontario between the North shores of Lake Huron and the South shores of James Bay. And uh, my family comes from a line of uh, folks who were involved with the fur trade and the uh, one of the first economies of Canada in, uh, in trading with the, the early settlers. I um, have been in 20, year, 20 years now in Toronto and I'm happy to call this my home and uh, am a guest on this territory, which is the original uh, land of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, um, and is the unceded territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And it's the home of the Dish With One Spoon Treaty territory, which is a treaty around uh, between nations, between uh, the Indigenous nations, and it predates Confederacy and predates the settler colonialism pieces. And it's around um, how do we make sure that there's enough for everyone, that we just take what we need, and that we make sure that we're taking care of the land and the resources for those spaces yet to come for those future generations. And so um, I lead the Indigenous Innovation Initiative. Again, my name is Sarah Wolf, and I I come to you uh, leading a dynamic group of people that runs a national program. Uh, it's an innovation platform that funds some of the boldest ideas um, by people who are closest to the biggest challenges in our community, in our society, uh, to develop, test, and scale those ideas. And so we can help to transform the impact um, at an at a individual, family, com community, and a national level. Um, I am joined by my friends um, who I love so much. So Magnolia, why don't I hand the talking stick over to you to introduce yourself and talk a little bit what you do. Sure, thank you so much, Sarah. So Sego, hello everyone. My name is Magnolia Peron. I'm from Tayandanega, Mohawk Territory, and a member of the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte, um, which is located about two hours east of Toronto. Um, but I am calling in today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation here in Ottawa, Ontario. And that's where I have the privilege to uh, live and work and play. Um, I'm currently the Indigenous Women and Youth Team Lead for the National Aboriginal Capital Corporations Association. We go by NACA for short, and our mandate is to support uh, a network of Aboriginal financial institutions, which are basically uh, Indigenous owned and controlled financial institutions that uh, work with Indigenous communities across Canada to provide uh, Indigenous businesses and entrepreneurs with access to capital and a range of business support services. And 
Uh, I've been with the association for just over two years now and been working on the, uh, with NACA on their Indigenous women and youth programming to ensure that both um, of those demographics have access to capital um, and wraparound support so that they can build and grow uh, sustainable businesses. And it, it's a really privilege to be here and part of the call. And I'll, I'll pass the talking stick over to Jacqueline. Ni Buju and Tanse, good morning. I'm Jacqueline Jennings. I'm of mixed, her mixed heritage. I am um, Cree and Anishinaabe, Métis, and of European settler descent by way of New Zealand. Um, my family um, also was involved in the fur trade, so we are spread far and wide from Treaty 1, Treaty 6, and Treaty 9 territories and down into Montana. Um, I was born and raised in the unceded and stolen territory of the Squamish Nation um, in what is currently known as Vancouver, and I reside there today um, as, a, as a guest and um, uh, in what is currently known as Gibsons on the Sunshine Coast, and I'm extremely grateful to the relatives and ancestors that have cared for this land that has cared for them since time began. Um, I um, am a, a mother and uh, a venture capitalist. <laughs> um, uh, my background is um, primarily in the, in the private sector was in vertically integrated retail models, um, but I also have a passion for entrepreneurship and leadership coaching, spending many years at um, very successful Canadian private and then publicly held companies with entrepreneurship as a uh, core value. And so over the last four years, my focus has shifted to exclusively working towards economic reconciliation and sovereignty for our people um, with a focus on entrepreneurship and innovation. As the director of the Fireweed Fellowship, which is the only national accelerator program for Indigenous entrepreneurs, and as a venture partner with Raven Indigenous Capital Partners, which is um, also the only Indigenous-led venture fund in the world. Our investment thesis covers um, specifically Indigenous-led uh, ventures that where we can draw a straight line to the increased well-being of our people. Um, so it's sector agnostic, we invest in tech, we invest in consumer products, um, health and agriculture, and um, you may be aware of some of our portfolio companies, Cheekbone Beauty, which I'm sure all of us are wearing some amount of today. <laughs> um, Virtual Gurus, um, which is a, you know, a, a shining star of a, a Canadian tech company on the rise with the only Indigenous woman to ever um, raise a Series A so far, Bobby Reset. Um, as well as our first couple of investments in the U.S. and uh, Navajo Power Homes and um, GNU, which is uh, the only Native American denim company. So really broad, um, really broad and um, amazing, um, you know, experience of always being the first. Um, it, it isn't always easy. There, it feels like there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of thirst for what we're creating. And I'm so excited and glad that I get to work with Magnolia and Sarah and Ashley, who's not with us, in, um, in really recapturing um, what has long been a, a successful, um, meaningful, relational tradition of wealth and trade and um, economic innovation for our people. Um, we're just needing to make some adjustments and, and having a bit of a reawakening and a um, a rebirth of what that looks like today, but I always, um, I always think it's important to put time into perspective, which is, um, you know, my ancestors on the west shore of James Bay were one of the first villages in Canada to have contact um, with Europeans in 1637. Um, so, you know, that's, that's how long our, our trade has been um, disrupted in a, in a colonial and capital sense, but there was, you know, 10, 15, 20,000 years where um, we were creating abundance and vitality for our people, trading from, um, you know, the, the farthest reaches of the Arctic well down into Central and South America. And um, I, I hold that in my heart as I do this work and sometimes feel like, how can I be working in finance? And 
Um, it's really just feels like stewarding the, the, the wisdom, the knowledge, and the vision of my ancestors. So thank you um, for joining us today. Thanks, Jacqueline. Um, so I see that one person's already picked up the pen and put a question in the Q&A. Um, we're going to try and manage like a little bit of a, an intricate, um, less so monitoring the chat, but if you really have burning questions kind of throughout, we're going to be pretty conversational here. And so throw your questions in and when it's the right time, we'll try and come back to them to answer them and make sure that we've um, addressed anything that's kind of burning or anything that comes up and then we'll try and leave some space at the end. Um, but in the interim, we're just, we're going to just start chatting about things that we love, but also to you know, kind of share uh, some of the wisdoms and the insights and things that we've picked up along the way. Um, Jacqueline comes from from this very, you know, much more, um, much more honestly and in, in a narrative that makes a lot more sense with her background from the private sector coming into venture capital. Um, I, I come from it completely out of left field. My background is uh, as a midwife and as a nurse. And so I come from being a primary healthcare provider, but really most interested in the entrepreneurship, the management administration aspects of the work that I'm doing. But also the system change that we needed within the healthcare sector and the frustrations that I had working at the healthcare front line um, around the different challenges that Indigenous families face that didn't seem to be the same for non-Indigenous families. And, you know, so many of those challenges, whether it was food security, housing security, child protection involvement, violence in the community, racism within the healthcare system, um, you name it, that those challenges seem to be so connected to poverty. And when we did a study in Toronto on what the rate of poverty was for Indigenous adults, we found that almost nine out of 10 Indigenous adults experienced um, uh, poverty at the below the low income cutoff level. And, and so it, it kind of goes to speak to, well, if, you know, if you're having a hard time with even just managing an unexpected expense, everyone that you know around you is probably also trying to work out how they're going to manage an unexpected expense and can't kind of float you, um, you know, any support. So it leaves very little room for the dreaming aspect of, you know, moving from this mindset of scarcity into a mindset of abundance. And so that's why I decided to move upstream and work with an innovation platform that's providing social finance to do something that's really around dreaming a different way of knowing and being or a way of knowing and being that's very integral to us, but, um, but maybe not as, as understood in the mainstream. So I kind of pulled out, you know, some of the key things that I think probably Magnolia, Jacqueline, Ashley, and many others, um, and along with myself, have been saying within the ecosystem for a long time, so that we don't spend our time talking about that con those contexts, but just this is, these are the things that we know to be true, um, what we want to do is really focus on what are the kind of the, the solutions and the mindsets that we need to start shifting for the work we're doing. But in just in terms of a context, we know that for Indigenous uh, entrepreneurs, for Indigenous innovators, communities, individuals, the number one challenge is access to capital. But it's not just as simple as access to capital. We need access to the right kind of capital at the right time, right? So whether it's grant-based capital, uh, loan-based capital, you know, equity-based capital, those things are really important, but getting to them to that at the right time with the right kinds of wraparound supports, right? So um, what are the capacity supports that um, individuals need? And just providing capacity support supports in the absence of capital doesn't make sense the same way it's reversed. Um, networks are one of the biggest assets we have within our communities. And so we're incredibly well networked as an Indigenous peoples and an Indigenous populations. If you ask me who so-and-so, do I know so-and-so from so, such and such a province? Like, I'm like, probably, yeah, I'm related to that person. Or yeah, I know them through these connections. We're so well connected with each other. But our connections into other markets and other networks is not necessarily as good. And so supporting those and leveraging those networks um, in other spaces. Working to support the impact storytelling, right? How do we tell our stories from our voices and not from the narratives of non-Indigenous voices? Um, 
and what are the what are the things that we're trying to impact that are important to indigenous communities uh, is a really important piece and then leveraging also that social capital right we don't always have the the lawyer in the family that can help us with different things um, we don't always have the, you know, the person who's an expert in finance who can help us to develop cash flows or, uh, you know, other, you know, templates and models that, or even just like friendly advice and conversation at the dinner table. Um, th those things aren't, aren't as well fleshed out. And so we really need to find creative and innovative ways to build all those things together. And those things are, are not like in a vacuum, a mainstream way of understanding those concepts doesn't work within Indigenous communities. And so all of those things need to be delivered in a way that is low barrier, culturally informed, relational, and builds off of you know, key values in Indigenous communities like reciprocity and respect and, um, and that relationality piece. Um, we, you know, I was at a, a talk at the prosperity, the Indigenous Prosperity Forum last week, and someone was just like the three key things that are the biggest barriers for Indigenous entrepreneurs is the Indian Act, our remoteness and risk. I might add diversity in there as well, but the Indian Act is something that predates Confederation. It's something that dictates every aspect of Indigenous people's um, lives, right, across our health, our education, our social services, um, you know, even defining who is or who isn't Indigenous within our communities is defined by the government and not by ourselves. So that's incredibly problematic. But looking at, you know, even just the impact it's had on intergenerational wealth, um, the, the erosion of our culture and our ways of knowing and being, and just the implementation of various systemic barriers, which of course the world is talking about all of these, we have to break down the system, you know, the systemic barriers for different populations and individuals. Well, we have very unique systemic barriers that are deeply embedded in that Indian Act. Uh, remoteness is a definite challenge, right, for many Indigenous communities, just even in terms of connectivity and tech, um, but also just the cultures are very distinct when you live in a remote community versus whether you live in an urban community. Uh, the diversity of Indigenous populations within Canada, even within First Nations, Inuit and Métis sub identities, um, you know, we have Cree, Haudenosaunee, we have different nations within our cultures that, that have very different approaches to how we do things. And so we need to understand what are the universal principles that pin, bring us together, but also how can we respectfully honor the different protocols that exist across different communities um, all throughout Turtle Island. And then risk is so deeply embedded into all of this and the understanding of risk and the willingness to take risks um, or to allow indigenous peoples to take risk and bias, it, it feeds into the risk measurement frameworks into how we define risk. So we need to start looking at how we can decolonize risk across those different pieces. Um, and so there's lots of other insights from that, but I'm sure it's all gonna come out. I want to just, again, encourage you to put questions into the Q&A section of um, the, the chat along the bottom. And I'm gonna just hand it out to my lovely friends here to say like, what do you think are some of the root challenges or root causes of the challenges that are faced by indigenous peoples and how are their needs different? Like give us some examples about how the needs might be different uh, from what mainstream investment practices and spaces offer. Hi, well, I can. Okay. Yeah, I was, I, was <laughs> Go gonna throw, I was gonna throw to Magnolia because I think you know, we have, we approach the solutions from very different perspectives. And I think that it's nice to have a grounding around um, lending. So I'll, I'll just, I'll pass to you. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. And I think like, when you were talking about the diversity in Indigenous communities, and all of the unique needs and things like that, what's unique about our network at NACA and our Aboriginal financial institutions is that they're really grassroots organizations. And so they're working closely with the Indigenous communities within their region or within uh, or with the communities that they serve. And so they have a really deep understanding of what the challenges are, what, what are the needs, um, what are the opportunities that exist within those communities that um, entrepreneurs uh, can take advantage of and work to, to meet the needs and, and fill needs really in their communities that are 
really left um, unmet by um, the government and so on. So I think, you know, that's what's really unique about our network is that we're, we really have deep understandings of the Indigenous communities that we work with and we're all over Canada. There's um, over 50 Aboriginal financial institutions. We have representation in, in every province and territory. And then I think um, in terms of the colonizing risk, I think that's the other uh, really uh, important thing about the Aboriginal financial institutions is that they're not just looking at the financial return um, of a Indigenous business, but they're and in terms of even when they're assessing a loan application, it's really a, a character-based loan. And, and that's based on their relationship with the entrepreneur. Um, so it's not what we often hear from Indigenous entrepreneurs who have access support through our network. It wasn't like how it is with typically with a mainstream financial institution where they're um, you know, given a loan and then it's like, okay, see you later. And all the bank cares about is being repaid. But actually our network... Um, really focuses on that relationship with the entrepreneur and supporting them every step of the way and ensuring they have access to a wide range of uh, business uh, services and supports that are going to help them succeed because the Aboriginal financial institution is invested just as much as the entrepreneur in their success. And so, like I said, they're, they're often looking at uh, the entrepreneur, the potential clients um, doing more character-based lending um, and that sort of thing, which I think is really unique. And we also do a lot of developmental lending um, because typically, you know, I think Sarah maybe had spoke about this, but because often in Indigenous entrepreneurs or sole proprietorships, um, they're often, especially for those that are located on reserve. Um, so often in, you know, mainstream financial institutions, eyes, they're considered higher risk. And I think that's what's really unique about our network is that they're able to do um, some of those loans that otherwise would not be provided by uh, financial institutions. And I think because they provide that wraparound support, what they find is that the repayment rate is um, really high. I'll pass it over to you, Jacqueline. Um, I was hoping you were going to say that part because whenever um, I hear presentations from um, our AFIs, the, the rate of repayment um, is so um, above the, the average of Canadian lending. And I'm always like, ah, oh, we need that data point like out front. Um, so thank you, Magnolia. I'm, I think just to kind of um, break into the unique challenges that we face, I was recently in um, a private capital course in Toronto um, at Ivy Business School and um, was chatting with one of the speakers afterwards. Um, I was the only Indigenous person in the class, which is not a surprise. Um, and, you know, we, we were talking about access to capital and, and he said, um, he, he was asking me and I, I you know, my, my soundbite is generally, you know, intergenerational wealth, we, we hold it, but it's in our language and in our culture and in our customs and in our, our relationship with the land and, and our kinship ties. But because of the Indian Act and legislated poverty and dispossession of land and disconnection from the land, you know, that is a, that is a huge hurdle. And, um, and he's, you know, he wanted to know more about it. And so I was explaining that, you know, if you if you choose to stay in your community and you live on reserve, you don't own your home. That's, you know, that's a very foundational aspect to building intergenerational wealth. And he said, well, um, they should change that. <laughs> and I said, well, if you had a situation where, you know, all of a sudden, um, and, and I'm just saying this because I think it's one of these like stupid questions that folks are afraid to ask um you know and 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 i said well if you if we were all able to put our houses up for as leverage um all of a sudden um with a population that's never been able to do that before and and has a lot of the intergenerational trauma around money that we have you know in one or two generations it's likely that banks would own a significant percentage of the homes on reserve so we would be further dispossessed of land through that process 
I don't know what the solution is. Many smarter people have worked on what do we do without the Indian Act. I'm not going to touch that at all. But I think it's just an important piece for everyone to know. Um, you know, and, and in that conversation, I just want to share, um, you know, he, he is this very intelligent finance man, um, really successful. And I could just see the the mindset changing. And there was another man kind of eavesdropping who comes from um, financing oil and gas and he's only invested in fracking. And we hadn't spoken of three days into the course and he turned around in his chair and he just said, you're blowing my mind right now. And I said, oh, did you think we just needed to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps? And he said, yeah, actually I did. And so I just want to name that there's also this bias that a lot of folks are carrying around why are, you know, proportionately and from a capitalist lens, so many of our people are still living in poverty. It's not out of laziness or, you know, inability, lack of motivation. There are fundamental legislated barriers to this success and to interrogate these questions as settlers about, you know, my family came here five generations ago with nothing. Well, they got free land. So if you come from, you know, a, a sixth or seventh generation Canadian family that came here with nothing and got a 50 acre farm in Alberta, they didn't come with nothing. Um, and the ability to borrow against that land, to buy farming equipment, um, even to have the ability to sell what you grew on your land was something that was legislated against Indigenous people at the same time. It became illegal. It, you lost your land if you didn't farm it. It was illegal to sell what you grew on your land and Indigenous people couldn't buy farming equipment. All of those, th all of those laws came into effect at the same time. So I think just that ground setting of what we're working and what we're building from, you couldn't even legally hire a lawyer until 1950. So the family lawyer that Sarah talks about not having access to that person, even if you did, you couldn't hire them legally until like the last 60 years. So that is a, that's a really critical sort of baseline setting. And then sort of the unique approaches that we're taking and building together to overcome that. I mentioned one and um, Sarah and Magnolia have heard me talk about this at length, but we need a trauma informed approach to talking about money. You know, when you have a population that has been legislated into poverty and marginalized, um, there is a lot of conceptions and, and emotions that come up around money. And it could be holding beliefs like money is poison, rich people are awful. It could be like, um, you know, beliefs that cause us to, when we get money, get rid of it, give it away right away. Um, there's a lot of overlap with cultural practices where, you know, what the wealth you had was measured by how much you could give away, which is this rich, beautiful tradition. And it only works in a community where the day after you give everything away, there are people there to take care of you. And that is not the situation that most of our, um, most of our kin are in. So um, really interrogating how we are approaching these conversations around money. I've worked with a lot of incredible non-binary and, and women indigenous entrepreneurs who have built their businesses from zero to a million dollars in revenue, completely bootstrapped with no debt because they could not imagine going into a bank and asking for money and the potential trauma that that would trigger or, or the harm that that would, the new harm that that would cause. So a trauma informed approach. And then the other thing that we're doing um, with equity based investing is, tr you know, basically having the most founder friendly terms possible. So patient capital, um, you know, a lot, we do a lot of deals with convertible debt so that we're really mindful not to over dilute the founders that we're investing in. And then as Magnolia said, a lot of those wraparound supports. So I'm probably a more hands-on investor and board member than most uh, VCs. And there's a reason for that because we are doing economic reconciliation. We are not uh, profit maximizing, we're profit seeking, and we're not trying to have one unicorn and all of the other companies, you know, go to zero. We're trying to see that incremental growth across the portfolio. Mm. And luckily we have investors and LPs who are on board for that. Yeah. No, I mean, I love that, right? Because there's, you know, <laughs> this, this whole trauma that we have around money and the, the perceptions and the myths that we even hold as 
as our own selves around what does it mean to have debt or what does it mean to share equity when we've worked so hard for it, right? If you bootstrap to get a million in revenue, like the idea of giving any part of that away is terrifying. Um, and not to mention the, um, you know, the, the vulnerability that they face in, you know, people who are going to look for the easy targets and the predatory acts, actions and predatory um, funds that are out there that are just looking for that, you know, profit maximizing, um, you know, win that is not aligned with our ways of knowing and doing. And, you know, what are the priorities for those Indigenous businesses? So that's a big challenge. On the other end of the spectrum, it's also trying to find that right balance of equity and debt and, you know, kind of your own personal kind of savings and loans. We don't have intergenerational wealth, so accessing those things is really hard. People are pouring their personal savings into it. Or for the ones that have made that shift to, to debt, like the CCAB is regularly kind of reminding us that, especially during COVID, people just can't take on more debt. The debt ratio that they're carrying is so large that the sustainability of their businesses is compromised and the the risk that gets perceived at the equity level or at other levels you know you know other banks like it just it, it creates even more challenges and burdens because we don't have the 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 the, the we don't have the right structures in place to support people to find those right balances and to understand those nuances across different sectors and industries of what is the right balance of debt and um, equity and, you know, and earnings that you, you should be making. So it's, you know, interesting that we have this emerging space that's starting to come out with more people who do understand that, you know, it, that, um, institutional kind of like support? How do we provide that wraparound support for different folks? Um, what are some of the myths that you would like to debunk around these things for our potential investors or funders or uh, supporters on the call? I feel like I did some myth debunking. So the only other thing I want to add is like, this isn't charity. I should um, add to that then. It's not charity because Indigenous business and innovation entrepreneurs are an excellent investment. Yeah, and I wanted to kind of build off what you were saying earlier. Um, one of the things that we're like getting into is the micro lending space and uh, something that came up at our Indigenous Prosperity uh, Conference last week was around like defining success. And I think this ties into the, the first question a little bit too, but um, particularly for Indigenous women that we're, that our microloan program is for. Often we're targeting um, home-based or part-time businesses, people who are maybe even um, doing this as like a side hustle, a passion project sort of thing. Um, and they just want to make a little bit of income for them, their family, be able to um, provide, and they want to stay small. Like not every um, Indigenous entrepreneur is looking um, to grow um, to, you know, the level that potential investors are looking for. But that doesn't mean that the impact isn't there. And I think like to your point, Jacqueline, like by investing in, in micro businesses or indigenous women owned businesses or businesses that are a bit smaller scale, like they are having um, financial impacts in their communities by creating jobs. We often see like a lot of particularly women-owned businesses. They're often in like retail or food or accommodations, um, uh, educational services, a lot of uh, services that create jobs within their community. And then I, we see that like women also are becoming like role models in their community. They're inspiring other women and young girls to see entrepreneurship as a opportunity, as a potential career path. Um, they're doing so many things, and, and I already spoke a little bit earlier around the repayment, and uh, what we see is that um, because women in particular are, are more um, cautious around debt and um, making decisions on their business, that they tend to have less like loan write-offs or, or miss less loan payments, so end up being a good investment um, for financial institutions, but it's really those like community impacts that are so important, and I think um, 
what was said by one of the panelists is that we need to start defining success on the indigenous entrepreneurs term. So I think that's really important is that we need to be um, mindful of where indigenous entrepreneurs want to be, what, what they're striving for and support them to get there and not, um, you know, let our ideas potentially um, impact that. So I think that's like one of the things that's really important um, for us to consider as well. I see you sh shaking your heads, Sarah. And well, smiling. I, it was funny because also at that prosperity forum last week, um, this very well-intentioned, but non-Indigenous high level person, I'm gonna just like say that from the finance sector, I won't say where from, um, mm -hmm. but made this super interesting comment, which was um, around the, the government and the provinces and the education sector need to get K to 12 right. Because if we get K to 12 right, then we'll have the next generation of people who are, um, you know, who are more well positioned to, I guess, assimilated into, <laughs> into understanding how to do this kind of work, right? And mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like, well, maybe it would be great if we could have a better K to 12 system that integrates more Indigenous ways of knowing and doing. But my immediate instinct was, yeah, we're matrilineal societies. And how do we reclaim the matriarch in this? Because if, if Indigenous women and gender diverse, you know, folks and the people who are the primary care providers of children have all of the means to be self-sustaining and self-determining and to take care of their families, the stress level is gonna be less. They'll be able to invest more time and resources into their children um, who will then thrive in the education system at that much better. And so the, I think that the, the, the K to 12 system ideas, it's not necessarily bad, but I think it's misled in the indigenous context, right? The whole reason that we're here is the residential school system and the impact that had on the intergenerational impact of, you know, families being disconnected from their culture, from their language and from their families. Um, and not just during childhood, but for like their entire lives, they often were disconnected from those spaces. Um, and it's really hard to recover some of those things, right? My mom went to residential school and did not recover the language. And we've had to work really intentionally and hard to try and reclaim as much of the culture back as we can. And even family members. I have a sister who adopted in the 60s. So those things are really incredibly important. But I wanted to kind of throw that back out. And I know that you're probably both going like, yes, reclaim the matriarchy. <laughs> but, but what is the impact of, under, how do we bridge that understanding of, you know, you know our, our traditional ancestral roles and, as matrilineal societies? And how do we bridge that into finance? Because I think that there's a unique space that's not just around gender equality in, for Indigenous folks. I mean, yes, certainly we need that because colonialism's impacted Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit folks much, much more. But the solutions, I think, are going to be different. And I think that you know, getting us from here to, you know, to thriving, it, it can't be at the exclusion of women, because that's actually, I think, the key to unlocking things. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. Um, I mean, I, I completely agree. I, I was sitting in on a, on a chat last night, you know, how Twitter, you, like, now is Clubhouse, you can listen to people talk. Um, and it was about, it was an, a, an event for the Black community in the U.S., about a black bank, that's a thing, amazing, that just acquired a black owned business. And that 400 people in the black finance community showed up to have a conversation about that because that's one of the first times that has happened. And so I, I'm, I'm often looking to our, um, I, I really believe that our liberation is tied together. The, the wealth in North America is built on uh, the labor of stolen people, enslaved people, and stolen land, um, and the way that, and the clearing of that land through violent means. And so I'm always looking to our relatives in the Black community because they, for a variety of reasons, um, most and a lot of them are popular. You know, they're a larger population. We're five percent of the population in Canada, two percent in the U.S. I'm looking always. What can I learn to bring back to the work that we're doing? I, I sometimes feel like we're about 20 years behind in this particular realm. 
And they were talking about how about 40 or 50 years ago, there was data collected about how $1 spent um, in the black community would circulate in that within that community for like um, up to four or five months. And now they said the measurement is um, it stays in the community for six hours before directly going out. And I was messaging with some of our sisters at Native Women Lead, and they, I was like, "Have you have you read any data about how this is, um, you know, reflected in our communities?" And and she said, "I think it immediately goes out, um, like you know, I don't know if they're measuring hours, but um, because so many of us are paying." you know, rent and groceries as our number one expenses, and those are all going to non-Indigenous people. But we did have some dialogue about, in terms of um, our sort of, uh, what's the word for <laughs> the money you have left over after your fixed expenses? Like what, you know, your Expo money, disposable, yeah. disposable, disposable yeah. income. The small amount of disposable income that Indigenous women have, I wager that that circulates in the Native communities for a lot longer than any other dollars. Mm. You know, we're all sitting here, we're wearing uh, Indigenous women-led uh, cosmetics companies. We all have fabulous earrings that are all led by queer Indigenous women. Um, you know, I would wager behind us, we have blankets, we have books, we have other um, we have medicine, we have other artifacts that were um, made by Indigenous women makers. And so I think about that impact of like how we're circulating those dollars amongst ourselves and those um, not just in commerce, but also in care and, and in community care. Um, you know, we're, we're taking each other meals, we're taking care of each other's children so that we can be here today. We, you know, we are... Um, D dropping off um, medicine when folks are sick or just checking in on them when they're having a hard time. And so just also thinking about our energy as that currency flowing through. Um, I really wanted to just, just sort of name, like I think that is a, a significant part of it. And then we have all this data that like, if you invest in women-led companies, they create 20% more return. <laughs> and we're still getting 2% of the capital. What? Like don't, you know, there's just this like cognitive dissonance. We're not, so we want more data, but actually when we get the data, we're not listening to it collectively. It's infuriating. Um, and, you know, in my industry, the number of women in venture capital, not indigenous, like just women, mostly white women has not increased in like 12 or 15 years. And even when it does at one firm, more money isn't going to women founders. So we have a lot of, internalized misogyny, um, internalized white supremacy to unlearn. And the other thing that I wanted to say, Sarah, about this idea that K-12 needs improvement, I've been spending a lot of time lately thinking about um, how we can do education and knowledge sharing in ways that are more culturally um, grounded. And I've received some really beautiful teachings that I have consent to share from, from Buddy Joseph and Chief Janice George from the Squamish Nation about how their education system worked pre-contact. And one of the most incredible things about living where I live is that they didn't have contact with Europeans until 1850. So like almost 200 years after my ancestors. Um, like, like real, like, not just like, hey, a boat went by and we traded them some stuff, but like settlement contact. Um, and he talked about um, at rite of passage, so usually between like eight and 10 years old, um, everyone in the community, well, first of all, the first thing to say is that children were the most important people in the entire community. We say that now, but like, we have a lot of evidence that is not true in dominant culture but they were the center of the community. So um, everyone had a role in raising not just their own children, but in raising their nieces and nephews. In fact, we didn't, a lot of our communities didn't even have names for those different roles. You were just like, everybody was your parent and everybody was your uncle and everybody was your aunt and everyone was your grandparent. And so they would watch, the whole community would watch the children at, when they were really young and then they would have meetings about what they saw the strengths of these children, and then they would assign them roles around the rite of passage. So, you know, if you were really adept at language, you might become 
a runner, which was like the internet. <laughs> you would speak all of the dialects of the communities around and you would carry messages, you know, invite people to gatherings and that would be your role. Or you, um, you know, you would, you would be a, a, an artist or a maker. An apprenticeship was our education system. In this territory, the young people were paired with elders, with their grandparents who were responsible for their education. Early days, it was all around stream keeping and, and protecting the water. And that's where they had their kindergarten and their grade one and their grade two. And that's what they learned about. And it makes so much sense to me that the elders who might be physically past their prime as providers now switched into this educator role where the parents were out, you know, using maybe physical strength to, to generate um, resources. And so I'm thinking a lot more about how do we apprentice as opposed to that, like, let's send you off into a room with a bunch of other people and mostly talk at you um, and do that sort of literacy and education. And how do, we, how do we invite our youth in and to help develop them into these places and these roles? So I don't have a, I don't have a comprehensive answer at the moment, but that's something I've been sitting with. I just wanted to, to jump in on both the, the matriarch conversation as well as the education piece. So I think, you know, we're seeing that in the Indigenous community right now that there's more Indigenous men that are participating in entrepreneurship and business development. But our research show was going back to that data <laughs> that Indigenous women are participating in entrepreneurship at a faster rate. Than Indigenous men. And I, I'm not going to be surprised if it um, exceeds the number of Indigenous men that are in business. But the, the, the point really is that those women um, are seeing entrepreneurship as an opportunity. As I mentioned earlier, they're becoming role, model, role models for younger women, for uh, youth in our communities, which I think is really important. But I think we also need, um, to Jacqueline's point, we need women um, in leadership positions within financial institutions. I know with our, our women's program we just launched, we've hired um, business support officers in a number of our Aboriginal financial institutions. And we said to our network, women want to work with other Indigenous women. So um, as much as possible, we need to fill those roles with other Indigenous women entrepreneurs because they have that lived experience. And to your point earlier on, um, having a trauma-informed approach. Like, I think that's what's so important because especially when we, we think about violence towards, our, towards women and girls and what we hear is that financial institutions often are male-dominated or that they're an old boys club. And um, that's why I think it's so important that we have women in those positions. And I just wanted to, to give a shout out to the SAGE initiative for what she's doing. It's particularly from an impact investing lens is, She's providing um, Indigenous women and, and non-binary folks with the opportunity to learn about impact investing and learn the, the language and see um, the opportunity that when we talk about a circular economy or that, you know, Indigenous women tend to circulate wealth longer in their community. I love what she's trying to do is exactly that by educating Indigenous women on how we can ourselves become impact investors and maybe it's in maybe you know maybe for some that means more at the micro level but I think that's a way that we can start to continue to circulate that wealth in our communities um, um, bring more women into uh, leadership positions uh, within financial institutions to be to see themselves as the I think like even Jacqueline yourself you're a role model right that women be, can become impact investors and or work in that space so and then I think you know um, around kind of the, the education piece there too. Like we talked about the Indian Act earlier. And I think like the other thing is that, you know, there's sex discrimination within the Indian Act and that's a becomes a barrier for indigenous women to access um, financing, um, especially if they, you know, because of the sex discrimination and women losing um, their native status as a result of uh, marrying someone who's non-Indigenous, you know, then they have more difficulty now accessing 
um, financing because perhaps they don't have um, a status card or a membership to a community. So when we talked about like indigenous identity earlier, connecting that to the Indian Act, that, that's all um, why we need that trauma-informed approach, having women um, in those positions to help uh, with that. And then on the like K to 12 on the education side, I think like one of the things like I've heard through, entre um, particularly from youth who've been through um, entrepreneurial programs or different education, that they really love learning about um, our history. And I love Jacqueline that you shared that earlier around Indigenous people are and we always have been entrepreneurial and we had these robust trade systems. And I think that's really empowering um, to youth, like when they hear those stories um, and it, it allows them to, you know, connect with their ancestors and say, hey, like they're entrepreneurial and I, I am too. Um, and I think one of the things that we're currently doing a, a research project, um, trying to hear from Indigenous youth entrepreneurs on types of supports that they're looking for and how we can better support them uh, to start businesses. And one of the things that came out is that youth are also interested in and when we talk about um, like business education, um, like doing uh, education that's like on the land, um, that's more experiential. So I think too, just changing the, the delivery uh, method of how we um, provide that, those educational opportunities to youth. And I think too, like it doesn't just end at um, like in high school, like I think there's opportunities for post-secondary as well. Um, I've been involved in some projects on um, like in, in business school curricula and education, how there's really a lack of um, Indigenous businesses represented in business school education. And often, as many of you may know, like in business school, they often use like the, the business case, the Harvard business case model for um, teaching. And typically, if Indigenous businesses are represented, it's they're not usually um, the main actor within the case. They're often a barrier that another business needs to overcome. So we need to also think about education beyond that and within business school and seeing um, more Indigenous business cases that um, represent the values and culture of Indigenous businesses and really disrupt, I guess, that traditional business education. Well, and even just in the MBA education space, I can say for mm -hmm. sure that during my MBA, we didn't talk about Indigenous business like at all, really. Um, I think we did a, a government relations unit that we talked about, you know, fishing and harvesting rights. And of course, that became a bit contentious. But anyways, another side of the story. But I was chatting with someone else who's in an Indigenous focused MBA right now and was like, can we talk about Indigenous financials in our accounting course? Can we review an Indigenous business's financials? But because there are no Indigenous owned businesses that are publicly traded, there's no Indigenous business for them to integrate into their learning and curriculum. And it's like, well, there's a big missed opportunity right there. Um, and then I'm also working with a major business school right now around, you know, developing their reconciliation plan. And, you know, it's like one of the key indigenous advisors was like, wait, when are people making their decisions around what they wanna be when they grow up? That's when we need to start targeting people. I around heard it's like great. Are. Oh yeah, I, I have a 13 year old for yeah. sure. Like, She's already known for a couple of years. I want to be a doctor when I grow up. It seems way too overwhelming for her to go into business <laughs> despite my efforts. <laughs> I, I want to add to that. I think it, you know, I'm, we, we haven't, the three of us haven't talked about this before. Sarah, you and I have chatted a little bit, but I recently for the first time taught um, entrepreneurship and innovation at BD School of Business in their Indigenous business leadership program in the e executive MBA. And I also think, you know, I, I bring a decolonial approach to, to a course where they're, for the first time, they have an incredible trailblazing woman, Indigenous woman leading the program. And the incremental change was, you know, it's also like clunky at the beginning. Like I had students who were like, I just need these letters so I can get the next job. And like, I don't want to do decolonial anything. Like I just need to have an MBA so that I can make more money so I can take care of my family, you know? And that is like real, you know, as well. And so I think there's like, you know, careful, I'm reminded to be careful not to, um, you know, 
kind of sweep us into a monolith around around this sort of education system. But um, I just want to also um, one of my favorite parts of my job is that like I know all of the bad news of how we got to where we are, but every day I get to surround myself with Indigenous excellence. And so I just wanna give a shout out and some love to Dr. Dara Kelly, who is working at SFU BD. And she has spent the last, I think, year and a half, two years of exclusively developing indigenous business case studies. We don't have any publicly traded companies as examples, but incredible businesses, including Salish Soils, um, which is a business on the Sunshine Coast, um, happens to be in my backyard. Aaron Joe is the CEO and he has developed with in collaboration with his nation on their lands, an incredible composting um, system and, and um, business where all of our community, indigenous, non-indigenous, everyone in our regional districts, household um, you know, food scraps are collected. They have commercial composters. They also take um, you know, many different types of biosolids. Um, and they generate beautiful soil, garden mulch. They also do remediation for the, the gravel mine that is in the First Nations. And, you know, soon they're going to be taking over more and more of the waste management in this space, which is like this incredible innovation of science and land stewardship and sovereignty and solving a problem. I mean, we were getting to the point with our landfill where they were going to start trucking our garbage on a ferry and then driving it six hours into the interior of BC and putting it in a hole in the ground. And the cost of dealing with our waste was about to double. And he was like, whoa, 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 this doesn't make any sense. And so that's that sort of like, there's some alchemy and this catalyst that's happening where not only is he serving his first nation, but he's gonna take care of the 60,000 other people that happen to live near him. And he's hiring guys out of um, recovery houses and giving them good jobs and training them up and getting them all of their certifications. And you know what? As soon as they're trained, they go work at the mine because they can make more money, but that's okay. <laughs> like we're also looking at different ways that that impact can be measured. Like he gave them a job and then they were able to get an even better job through the training and, you know, and having sort of this like open arm, open hearted policy where you know we can we can measure those people who are coming through that organization. So I'm excited that there is change. Anyone in the audience who has an MBA has sat through those. Like I would imagine, probably not only are they not indigenous businesses, they're all white and probably mostly male led. Though now everyone's favorite is to talk about the Theranos case. But like, so we got one woman, but it's a what not to do case study. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to say that change is on the horizon and thank you for putting Dara's um, work in the, in the chat. I really appreciate that. What's funny. What did they say? There's more CEOs named John than there are CEOs. That are um, women. <laughs> period. <laughs> um, but the, the innovation and the environmental space kind of segues mildly into Alexander's question around ways to improve energy resiliency by bringing solar to communities. You know, where I first go to is, you know, well, it's this idea of, you know, are we going in to sell a product to an Indigenous community because you think it's better? Is it actually better for the community? And what does the community really benefit from that resiliency? Uh, is it a true resiliency? And how do we bake in like other benefits and reciprocity into it? And, you know, so, so many times it's like, how do we integrate our technology into indigenous communities? It's like we have, to, like we're relational at our core, we are relational. And if you want to work with indigenous communities, you have to build those relationships. You have to invest that time and space and you have to come at it with humility and understanding that we've been let down so many times that building trust is not just like one big great promise of, of mm -hmm. fixing or solving things, but it's, it's, um, it's building trust over time. It's showing up over time and it's many small truths over time that builds those relationships. And so you, that's where you need to start if you wanna work with indigenous communities. There's no big one kind of um, you know, solving of the piece. But what I really would love to start kind of maybe diving into a little bit is you know, a bit self-serving around the innovation space, but the, um, 
the whole notion around innovation and environmental sustainability. And so we know that we are in an environmental crisis, right? So just even within Canada in the last year, like we've had heat waves, we've had floods, we've had storms that have been catastrophic, right? So the entire BC South Coast like was washed out um, after having masses of fires in the summer because of the heat waves and the global warming is impacting us in like, really substantive ways just even within Canada and pushing things um, to extreme levels and accelerating it. Well, Indigenous peoples, we make up 5% of the global population, we're about 5% in Canada as well. Um, we're stewards for about 26% of the land, the world's land, but 80% of the world's biodiversity. And we have maintained consistently around the globe as Indigenous peoples, that we are in relationship with the land, with our mother, the earth, and with the waters, with the air. And we see ourselves as part of this greater ecosystem um, that is also alive. And we have those relationships that are established. This is one of our most important relationships. The earth can survive without us. We cannot survive without it. <laughs> and so, how do we maintain those relationships? We need to start treating our, our mother better. Like we, like this is a relation and how like the way we have been treating her is terrible. I had one um, auntie elder kind of say, you know, we've all been sent to our rooms to, you know, to behave ourselves with COVID, right? <laughs> because we have, we've, we've not been taking care of things. So the innovation space is prime to work with Indigenous communities. And it's such a missed opportunity if we don't work with Indigenous communities who have those close relationships and ancestral, intergenerational, ancestral knowledges and wisdoms about how um, th those relationships can benefit our communities, but how we need to take care of them better. So I would love to hear, like, what are the opportunities that you guys have seen around innovation and connections to environmental stewardship, uh, climate action, you know, alternatives to extraction economies? You want to take that first, Nadal, or I can go if you want to think about it a little more. Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I put one one thing in the, the chat, which is the community driven outcomes financing that Raven is um, working on it, we have a um, we have our venture fund so we will just for a little bit of background. Um, so we raised $25 million in um, 2020 for our fund one uh, we've made 11 investments in eight companies we're in the process of raising 75 million for our second fund which will be deployed. 50-50 Canada and the US. And then we have a, a national charity where a lot of our um, innovation work happens to enable you know, grants and, and research funds to flow through. So as a part of that foundation, the Community Driven Outcomes Finance is one of the ways that we're approaching um, the problem that Sarah's talking about. So the, the sort of pilot, there, there's two sort of um, pilot projects, but the, the first one was um, installing, um, uh, ge like I'm, I'm going to mess up the technical term, but basically it's geothermal um, heating in people's front yards, and it doesn't go too deep. <laughs> like when when I think of geothermal, they're like digging way down into the ground. So it's like it's like some version of a micro geothermal system, and um, and and testing it out in communities that have been on reliant on diesel forever that have never been hooked up to the grid. So remote community solutions that are getting those communities off of diesel. And in the North where solar is not very effective a lot of the year. Um, so looking at creative solutions and also developing those through deep engagement with the community instead of coming, even as indigenous people, we need to be very careful. We're not being like, well, you know, I know what's best for this community that I have no relationship to and has different language and different cultural values. So deep community engagement solutions lab process. So testing um, out different solutions and options and then ultimately letting the community decide what they want and then getting really creative about how we can finance those solutions. Um, and the other 
one that we're doing right now is around um, diet, type two diabetes prevention, early intervention, developing custom culturally sound, unique early interventions for those communities. And, and really like, uh, because this isn't my focus of work, the, but the very simple way that I explain it to myself is, you know, the cost of an adult in Canada having type two diabetes from say, like, I think like their forties onwards is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to taxpayers. And if we can create an early intervention that either pushes that later or hopefully eliminates it altogether, there is a massive cost savings to the public. And so I think about that margin um, is what the, uh, Jeff and his team um, are working on, um, being able to leverage um, in, a, in a social finance instrument. And then, you know, obviously I, I shared um, a link to our portfolio investment companies. So Navajo Power Homes is, you know, doing small grid um, household solar installations, but there are so many, we just have to basically listen to communities and let them tell us. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of wisdom and, um, you know, knowledge that um, has been collected. And I, I just, I think this is a little bit of a segue, but I just want to say that, like, there's a lot of well-meaning and, and organizations and people in government and institutions that want to help. And I think we really need to interrogate the type of data that we're being, the threshold for the type of data that we're being required to complete and submit before we can take action. We are in Canada and as indigenous people, the most heavily extracted in the forms of data and survey collection. We have tremendous survey and data collection fatigue. We have communities that won't even open the door if you knock on it to ask them about their housing, let alone on their energy use or any of those things. We have the knowledge already and we hold it maybe in different ways. Maybe it's not in a spreadsheet, but if you ask anyone who, any one of us, you know, about what's happening in our community, we can tell you, you know, there are people already in the communities that know what, need to, what needs to be happening. So I think we need to really move away from this laborious over, over collection of data and, and move into action around some of these things. We have the solutions, we just need the money and we need the like, the get going. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it speaks so, so highly to this idea of self-determination, like the community driven outcome is like, it's just so critical in our communities to be letting communities define what is important, how do we do it? What are the solutions to the challenges in their communities? Because, you know, 150 years or more of being told this is the solution that you need has gotten us nowhere. And so, well, we're actually closest to the problems. Let us define what the solutions are. So our platform, the Indigenous Innovation Initiative, so we're grant-based finance uh, for the most part. And at scale, we work with a lot of blended finance models and we'll support um, in, you know, in different ways. That makes sense depending on what industry, what sector, but it's working with the communities to self-determine what are the priorities. But environmental stewardship, it's one of these ones that I find really weaves through everything, right? So we have this also uh, funding Cheekbone Beauty, this cosmetics company that, you know, is doing fabulous stuff um, to make us all feel really great now. Um, really working hard as a social enterprise to, you know, redefine the standards and images of beauty and what like identity means within Indigenous communities, and particularly for our youth who've been so hard struck. But the environmental sustainability piece, it gets, like it gets underplayed, but that's potentially where some of the biggest impact is is creating, you know, you know, pushing the boundaries around sustainable packaging and, you know, re repurposing agricultural food waste in the formulations to really like integrate that environmental identity, culture kind of aspects into this, what is becoming a, like a really sustainable and transformative business. But it's not just like, what sector do we define this in? Um, in within our portfolio, um, most, well, we ask everyone, how are you honoring the land and how are you honoring the water um, as, a, as a critical component of our impact measurement and even just our screening processes? Like, are you honoring those things? Are you honoring Indigenous rights and are you honoring Indigenous ways of knowing and being? Um, so those are really key important pieces. But, you know, we have, you know, sustainable 
uh, construction practices and we have sustainable finance models that you know also are looking at what are their environmental impacts um, you know we're we're funding, uh, you know, tech innovation in the aerospace industry that's looking at land stewardship and opportunities for Indigenous communities to bridge it land stewardship pieces. And in, you know, our next round, which we're still also selecting, you know, collecting, um, you know, revenue for, for investing in our charity or in our not-for-profit so that we can be the intermediary to support culturally grounded ways of delivering grant-based capital for innovation, because we all know that investments and in innovation is is a tricky one right you can't get a loan for a, testing a new idea that's never been tested before and so how can we start to build out some of these ideas in our communities but our four key priorities and let me just make sure that i got them right environmental sustainability is like right up at the top right what are the alternatives to extraction industries that indigenous communities are already visioning envisioning and you know imagining to, that need you know money to develop test and scale what about data sovereignty, right? So we talked about the Excel spreadsheet and all this data that we have. How are we taking ownership of that data and how are we being able to use that for impact storytelling that's from our own narratives? Um, what about the holistic wellness? And that includes our ability to connect into the land um, and look at wellness from, a, that, from that whole person perspective. And then just that cultural and language revitalization and the opportunities for innovation in those spaces are cultures in the language and in the language and in the culture are the are the answers and the solutions to unlock some of those biggest challenges that we as an entire society have and so there's a ton of opportunities in that um I know that we're, we're almost, can you believe that we've been talking for an hour and 15 minutes? Okay. Um, I can't because, you know, I could chat with these ladies all day, but just wanted to get in, like, what are, what are some of the opportunities for building more comprehensive ecosystems? And then I'm going to start reading these two questions that came in that are long. So I can't, I'm having a hard time multitasking with. <laughs> I can start with that question while, while you read <laughs> the Q&A. <laughs> I think I know if Ashley was here, she would uh, speak to it. So Ashley Versard, Versard, sorry, is the director of the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub back Indigenous, and she's worked to bring together a collective of organizations that are working in the Indigenous women's entrepreneurship space. And I know both Jacqueline um, on behalf of uh, Fireweed Fellowship and Sarah on behalf of I3 are part of that. But there, I think there's a group of what, like ten of 10 or 12 organizations now, and it's grown organically over the last um, two years. And it's so nice that we're able to come together um, on a monthly basis to talk about and share what we're working on, what are some of the challenges we're facing, and then explore ways on how we um, can collaborate and work together and partner on things so we're not creating um, services that are competing with one another, um, but rather that complement what we're doing and finding areas that um, overlap nicely. So I think like if we can take what we're doing and replicate that across the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem and landscape, we would be so much better off. And I know, you know, from an economic development lens, NACA, we're part of um, a working group with a few other uh, key Indigenous organizations that have recently um, or have spent over the last two years working on an Indigenous economic development strategy that's built on uh, four key pillars. Land is one of them and it's going to launch later um, in June so stay tuned for that but that is also another example of how organizations within our ecosystem can come together and um, collaborate and find areas where we can work together to ultimately better serve um, you know, Indigenous entrepreneurs. And I know like one of the things like what we're trying to do at NACA and with our um, network is trying to improve even like the referral process and ensuring that we're not losing entrepreneurs and businesses along the way. And that, I think that's why having the relationships with other organizations like um, I3 and uh, Fireweed Fellowship is so nice because we can personally introduce entrepreneurs to each other and ensure that they're we're not losing them or they're getting lost along the way because it can be so confusing as an entrepreneur as an innovator trying to like um, sift through all of the different resources and supports that are out there and trying to figure out like what what can I access what 
you know, if I'm looking for a specific service, where should I go? Who can help me? So I think like by us being better connected, we're better able to uh, link in entrepreneurs within each of our respective um, networks into each other so that entrepreneurs are really getting um, a whole suite of services and support that they need. Well, it really helps us prevent the redundancies, right? Like, so we all know that the biggest challenge is access to capital. Okay, that's great. If we were all doing the same kind of capital delivery, like that does not help anyone or serve anyone, right? So here you have, you know, grant-based startup, you know, seed level funding, you have, you know, the loan kind of based uh, products that are available to, that, you know, culturally grounded and, and relevant. And then you have the equity and it, it's the complement of those things, right? That's one of the first things you learn in your finance class during your MBA. It's like, you need to have the right balance based on what sector you're in. And so, you know, being able to identify that we need to be bridges in those spaces and, you know, where are the gaps that we're seeing? Well, the, the knowledge, um, you know, knowledge building and capacity building space. And so hence the Fireweed Fellowship pops in, right? And then, you know, wait a second, we need a bit more research. research. And so we have the knowledge network that can help us to support some of the research pieces. And where, you know, where are we bringing the networks in? Okay, hey, here's the Lyft Collective and they can come in and, you know, it's, it's you know, us taking care of each other in a good way so that it's not just around constantly looking at the gaps, but seeing where the opportunities are and making sure that the redundancies are not happening. There's so much work for all of us to do. There's no need to be in a competition mindset. You know, we can work this out together from a community perspective and in a community way in service to the community um, that we're all from and part of. And, and so uh, kind of, I love this collection and network as well. And I think it's like a really, that system level piece is such a critical um, element of the innovation of the ecosystems that we're working with them. I, I want to just add that, like, that we put that together, you know, and Ashley's been so instrumental in convening that, but that has been very ad hoc. There's no core support for that system, that network level, you know, and I, to a degree, though it is critical to all of our jobs, there is no we're kind of doing it off the side of our desk because we were like, oh, we just did this event and then you're doing that event and we didn't, and it's kind of covering the same topic and like we need to be in the same space, but I don't know that there's anyone really thinking about how to support that networking um, other than, you know, all of these indigenous femmes who were like, we just need to do this. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm now thinking about sort of a similar, um, there's, a, there's a conversation happening about how do we recruit more Indigenous women into finance and sort of a roundtable discussion about this cross-border, but nobody really wants to pay for it. So yeah. that's, there, there's, um, there's core funding into the support of the network of these organizations. So, you know, I'm having these conversations like on the weekend or after hours, cause it's not really part of my job, but I also, you know, I have the, the dubious luxury of having the title at the moment of being the only indigenous woman in venture capital, as far as we know in the world. And there was one other, and then she got poached by one of their portfolio companies. <laughs> um, I don't want that to be the case. And I also want, you know, six uh, queer young or, and women to replace me who like grew up on reserve and didn't have, you know, aren't necessarily like urban indigenous and didn't have the proximity to privilege that I had, you know, and I'm coming up behind the partners at, at Raven Capital who are all men. like. We got to keep passing the the baton and the mic, and we have to have the, um, you know, we're we're all really focused on how do we support the entrepreneurs, and I'm also now starting to think about how do we support our um, succession planning, yeah, and and not just succession planning because it's not enough that like you know that the six of us or seven or eight or of us exist. There needs to be like twenty five and then a hundred and then you know all of these younger folks coming up to take our jobs so that we can you know retire by the river or something <laughs> go to sarah's cottage um and you know drop into board meetings and and mentor and focus more i don't have time to mentor right now like yeah. and i really really want to but like nobody's paying me to do that and you know 
again, we're all of us professionals in this space are still coming from that same system of non-intergenerational wealth. A lot of us are single mothers. A lot of us don't have family support. Like I, I'm not, uh, I'm not a philanthropist, you know, from a, from a family where no one's had to work for three or four generations. So yeah. those are sort of top of mind as well. I just wanted to make a couple comments on the questions um, that will probably not feel satisfactory to the questioner first, but just in terms of the conservation space. And yeah, we have been excluded from the conservation space for far too long, right? But we, we were the conservationists of our lands and territories for a really long time and we took care of it and we were in relationship with it. And the exclusion of indigenous peoples from those spaces has meant the mismanagement of those spaces, right? And so if you look at the fires that you know rage around the world, depending on where the hotspot is at any given point, you know, indigenous peoples had ways of managing the forests and managing the lands such that we didn't have those catastrophic world on fire situations. And there's now some spaces that are starting to bring indigenous peoples in to kind of start stewarding those things. And so you need to build those relationships to make sure that you're building those conservation, um, inclusive conservation spaces and that conservation uh, ecosystem and community will only benefit from bringing those relationships in. The other one was around uh, also the, the green narrative and, um, you know, kind of reconciling the, you know, extraction from the land to, you know, how do we reclaim that intergenerational wealth? Um, and also this whole narrative around power and the, the balance of power and the rebalancing of power. And, you know, it would be nice if there was just like a, you know, we want our land back and we want our money back, like kind of peace, right? Like, can we make this all fair for everyone? But we live in a capitalist society. And so we know it's not just around that. And it's going to take a multi-pronged approach to rectify many of those, um, those, those disbalances in power. And it's going to take policy. It's going to take education and learning. It's going to take, um, representation at all levels, right? So it's not just having a relationship with a community, but not giving them any decision-making power, not giving any equity in those, um, in those relationships, not giving any, just, you know, um, ability to take care of the community in those spaces, right? We talk about like bringing new kind of minds in to, you know, extract the minerals that we need to, you know, deliver on the carbon, you know, reduction mandates, right? So we need these new technologies, the new minerals to build the technology so that we can, you know, get off of, you know, you know, petroleum-based products and don't have to revert to nuclear, but yet we have to talk about the social issues that go into it. So they're multi-pronged and complex and it's going to take um, lots of different pieces. You know, it'll take some goodwill, um, but it'll also take like, you know, enforced policies and bringing more Indigenous peoples into gate keeper positions so that, you know, we have that power to, to, you know, be part of those conversations and part of those decision making. So we have five minutes, not 10, five minutes left to this conversation. Um, what's the role of the philanthropic and investment sector in supporting Indigenous um, economic reconciliation? My number one, my number one recommendation is for the most senior leadership in those organizations to undertake decolonial and anti-racist work on a personal level and an organizational level, because I consistently see good intentions without the unlearning waste a lot of people's time and end up with the same outcomes because the buy-in at that level is not complete mm. to the degree that they're willing to do self-examination. That's it. I think I'll just add that there's a lot of Indigenous-led intermediaries like I3, like Raven Capital, like NACA's recently launched Indigenous Growth Fund. Um, so if you're uh, an investor and especially like interested in the impact space, there are um, our organizations that are working very closely with Indigenous communities and Indigenous businesses that are here and can help facilitate that. So um, please reach out to us. Yeah. 
Um, those are two great things. And Magnolia, you stole the kind of the last kind of closing point I was going to make, but I think that the, you know, just going back to that number one, right, is that um, indigenous led businesses are like amazing, right? Like this is not a deficit based charity, you know, savior um, space. This is a huge opportunity. We are an excellent investment. We are a transformative investment. And we, you know, we need to start addressing those biases and those power differentials so that we can actually thrive in these spaces because we're here and we're ready. And there's, yes, get out of the way, give us the money and get out of the way, right? And we promise to deliver on it, but we come at it with very different um, ways of knowing and doing and different priorities and different approaches that will be unfamiliar. And that's a really scary space to be in. So you have to do that personal unlearning um, and go on those personal journeys, but get out of the way. We will, like, we're so invested in our communities. We're so, like, we are from the communities. And so we have everything to lose in this. So um, we need to be trusted to, to, yeah, to, to be the ones that are, you know, charged with leading these transformative changes. So any other last thoughts or comments you wanted to make? I, I just want to put in the chat um, before we go, I'm, I've been thinking about it, um, how we approach these conversations around distributions of power and money. And if we can learn um, how to regulate our own nervous systems and recognize our trauma around these conversations. You know, I'm working with all these incredible, intelligent women who, you know, like I'm sure most of us have some like crippling, you know, triggers around finance or negotiating or whatever that we're just like managing. So learning to regulate and co-regulate our nervous systems. And so before I, I wanted to go, because I feel, I feel fired up. And I feel, um, you know, I, I feel tingly and I feel activated. And I just wanted to invite everyone um, in the space, if you're feeling some sort of way, you know, and it feels comfortable for you to, to just find um, your feet on the floor and, and maybe bring some of your awareness into how it feels to, to sit in your seat. And, and maybe if you can, um, look around, um, take your face, your eyes away from the screen and look around the screen. Maybe you can even see a tree or a flower um, or something, um, you know, in a different depth of field to just help bring a bit of ease um, into your nervous system and into your heart. And um, this is, this is a practice that we lead in all of our work uh, around this to, to help us all um, activate the prefrontal cortex of our brain where creative problem solving and executive function and decision making happens instead of moving back into um, you know, the animal part of our brain that thinks we're under attack. And so I just, I thought maybe like ending with some grounding would feel really good and, and if it, we tend to be floating heads on these Zoom screens and forget we have a body. So, you know, if it feels um, good to, to just bring your awareness um, into your belly or to your breath. Amazing. Thank you for closing us with that, Jacqueline. Uh, I love that. So just want to shout out to everyone on the call. We got, um, a, you know, pretty good participation and thank you for your questions. And, and thank you for just sharing the space with us for the last hour and a half. We know it's a big commitment of time, but we're really just grateful to um, everyone who wants to sit and listen to us have these kinds of conversations. And we invite you to connect in with us. We're all here to kind of keep advancing that space. So Gitchi Miigwech to everyone, a big thank you. All the women in the front who are leading the march. Welcome to the matriarch. This is their time, they're here to leave a mark. Welcome to the matriarch. Welcome to the era of the matriarch. Our women are rising, take a look around. Harnessing their power, never backing down. Hear the beating of the drum, that's a sacred sound. This is unceded territory, you're treaty bound. We had treaties way before the Constitution.